maybe it revert back over time. But in terms of proprietary trading groups and um, and trading arcades, I think there's a big growth in trading. And in, in markets like FX, you know, the markets are massive, so there's plenty of room for people within those. Um, the challenge is obviously in, in trading is, is getting good training and getting good support to enable you to be successful. Uh, is it worth to pay for an internship in a prop trading firm? Um, some prop trading firms will train you for free. They'll select you based on your talent, train you for free. They're probably the ones I would advise going for. If you're paying for training, I'm always a little bit cautious because I'm thinking, well, you know, if they're, if they're good at training, they should be making money from me, you know, from in other ways, from the, the profit split and so on long term. Why take money in the short term? So I'm always cautious about paying for things like that. I'm not saying that there aren't good firms that do that. I'm just saying that would be my reservation. Um, because if people are providing it for free, then the expectancy is obviously they're going to make their money from you in terms of the profit splits and the commissions going forward. So just, be, just go into open eyes and, and be wary of, of the model. I'm just communicating here with Shai, so bear with me, we might get some slides in a moment for you folks. Well done by the way, because pretty much every single person who was on earlier is still hanging on 40 minutes in. Uh, even my wife gets bored with me after 40 minutes, so well done. Um, okay, I'm back in. Uh, Trade volume and bias by sell is an indication of market sentiment. How would you interpret the volume action in like this? Ray, I can't answer that, my friend, because I'm not, uh, my expertise isn't in trading strategy and so on. So I couldn't give you a good, solid, honest answer. So uh, I'm going to swerve it, um, I'm afraid. Uh, trading the zone and discipline trader, both by Mark Douglas, a good trading psychology book. Absolutely. Uh, Is it true that if you work for a pop trading firm, you'll not be able to work at an investment bank? Um, not necessarily, but investment banks typically take a lot of their, um, their grad through the grad program. They're a little bit wary of prop traders because prop trading is all about obviously taking risk and so on. Some prop traders do get bad habits in terms of um, attitude as well as in terms of trading. Um, over, over past years, it's had a, you know, a bit of a bad name. Uh, prop trading. Having said that, there's lots of very, very, very good prop groups out there that are very professional and are set up just with the same risk structure and everything else as investment banks. So, um, but certainly it's not an easy transition from prop trading to to um, to bank trading. Okay, I'm just going to send these slides over to Shai. Bear with me a minute, please, folks. Okay, let's have a look here. Uh, interesting thing there from Dan around uh, demo accounts. Um, the thing with demo accounts is that they're good to begin with. So if you think about progression, because if you start trading live straight away, the challenge is you can make just execution errors, and each execution error costs you money, which is unnecessary. So learn the basic skills of execution and, and your strategy on the sim or you know on the demo account. Go to small size first. There's no you know because in the early stages, you make the most mistakes. You won't be surprised here that investment banks and prop groups don't give you thousands of contracts to trade on day one. Have a guess what you start with. One contract. Until you get good, and then when you prove yourself that you're disciplined and reliable, then those contracts increase, and it can be quite aggressive, but the starting point is the same. Start small, that's when the mistakes start, that's when the learning is. You know, It's the cheapest place to learn is at the beginning, so make all your mistakes early on, and, uh, and go from there. But point taken, at a certain point, 
the psychology isn't the same with small size or on the sim so you need to get you know in there with the real stuff as we all know I think you know we all, we all pretty much agree with that uh, which is the best market for trading the best market for trading is the market which you are interested in which has uh, which moves in a way which suits you as a trader uh, which has the liquidity which enables you to trade the size you need to trade and provide the hours for trading which allow you to trade it so it's not necessarily an actual market itself it's just the one that suits you that's best for you some people are great FX traders they're not going to be good bond traders necessarily you know so because of either their interest or, and all these factors so it, it's really finding what works for you Could I recommend some successful strategies, please? Uh, okay, look, here's the key point, folks. There is no successful strategy that anyone can give you just off the bat. Because if it works for that one person, then it works for that person. It doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. Okay? So the big misconception in trading, and I hear it all the time, so apologies if you hear me chuckling here, but it, I just... I hear it all the time. What is the strategy? Can you give me the strategy that works? I've worked with about, I don't know, thousands of traders now over the last six years. And they're all doing things in slightly different ways. There might be some common themes, and I'll come to those, because that's important. But there's not one strategy. And if you read books like Market Wizards and New Market Wizards, which are great books to read if you haven't read them already, by the way, stories of the best traders from America over the last 20-odd years, what you'll see in those books is that the theme between them isn't, some sort of strategy, it, it, it's the mental approach and the discipline. That's where you see the commonalities. And um, Curtis Faith, who was in the Turtle Trading Project, you know, they have their, their four steps to successful trading. Create a strategy with an edge. Manage risk. Be consistent. Keep it simple. And that's it. You know, so it's finding your strategy. It's managing your risk. Be consistent with it. That's the execution. And then keep it simple because sometimes people try and make stuff complicated because they feel it should be. And I think Einstein said, keep it as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's probably the same in trading. Lots of the traders I know who are phenomenal traders and make great amounts of money, if I told you what they did, you'd say to me, no way, too simple. But that's why they make lots of money because they're keeping it simple and consistent. That, that, that's the crux of it, it's the consistency. Uh, okay, so uh, Altad's been chasing his losses. Um, I'm sure we all know that's an absolute no-no, folks, yet, chasing losses. That's one of the big doom, doom uh, behaviours. Um, if you look at why most traders fail, it, it's inadvertently linked to chasing losses, yeah. Um, sadly, our psychology, our natural human psychology and biology kind of supports that, that approach. It just doesn't work for us in trading. You know, it's interesting that lots of our natural human behaviours, whilst they work for us in life generally, they don't actually help us to be good traders because, you know, Evolution hasn't designed us to be good traders. It's not what we, hit, what, what, what we were here for in, in the early days. So a lot of our biological programming isn't also uh, great for us to be great traders. So uh, part of being a great trader is being able to overcome, as Warren Buffett says, overcome the urges and temptations that get most other people into trouble. And uh, that, that is very true indeed. Uh, okay, let's have a look here. Uh, you say here about, uh, Dan, you're saying about uh, on the demo six months to a year, uh, such a worst thing to do. Uh, I know where you're coming from, but I'll tell you one thing. There's a young trader in London. He's about 23, 24 years old. Started trading at 19. Between 19 and 20, spent the whole year on the sim. Worked really hard. Made teas and coffees around the, uh, the trading room where he's working. 20 to 21, started to, you know, get a bit of an idea about what he was doing, 
between 22 and 24, he's smashing it. You know, he's a, he's a seven figure a year trader, you know, he's making millions a year. Uh, phenomenal trader. And he says a lot of that was down to the discipline of trading on the sim for that year as well. So, uh, you know, horses for courses, but I think, you know, we've got to look at everything. Everyone's different. It's what works for you. The danger is, though, you get too used to the sim and never move on. And that's obviously not a great thing. Uh, Dave Robson's playing his guitar. Um, I've got my guitar here. I don't know if we fancy having a bit of a duo. I know we won't be able to hear Dave, but you better hear me. Um, thanks for that, Dave, anyway. Obviously glad that I'm in entertaining you and enthralling you with my uh, expertise. Uh, I said that some FX firms will give you training for free. Can you recommend a few firms? Uh, I don't recommend any firms. Um, there are plenty out there. Do your research. Type in prop trading groups. Um, trading arcade. Um, becoming a trader. They're all out there. I think um, there's plenty of forums where you can find the listings of them as well and, and websites. So. Um, you do your research and, and that's the best thing to do you know do, do, it, for, do, it, for, do it for yourself there um, let's move along here what are some things the top traders do before sitting down to trade for the day great question the number one thing they do that most traders don't do is they actually do some preparation and research so I like to liken it to the gym uh, if you go down the gym, those of you who go down and you look at the amateur people in the gym you know the everyday just uh, keep fit fanatic they go in, arms and legs, bit of a shake, a little bit of a stretch and a limber up, 15 seconds running on the spot, straight on the exercise machine, bang, 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 bang. Look at a, a serious athlete going in there and they'll spend probably 15 minutes warming up. Uh, likewise at the end, casual gym goer, bit of a shake, in the shower, lovely, off we go. Whereas the, the, the proper uh, serious athlete is going to spend about 10 minutes cooling down. Likewise in trading, the, the more casual trader just turns up, turns the screen on, that looks good, bit of price movement, must be an opportunity, bang, let's find something to do. The more serious trader, preparation and research before trading. So I use an acronym which is PREP, P-R-E-P, and um, what I would say is with PREP, here are the four things, four components. Number one, planning and preparation is the P. So in that is looking at your strategy, it's aligning it to the trading day coming out, in terms of what is going to happen. It's also about um, thinking about how you might trade during that day and looking at what news is going to come out, what event risk might there be during the day. R and E is rehearsal of eventualities. So what else could happen during the day and how will you deal with it? And finally P, positive state. Am I ready to go? How do I feel? Mental, emotional, physical state. How is it? Simple technique, one to 10. 10 it's good, one it's not good, where am I? If it's a one, two, three, you probably shouldn't be trading. You've got a mid area, you've got to make a judgment call, top end, bang on, ideal trading state. So prep, plan and prepare for the first P, R, rehearsal of E, the eventualities, P, positive state. And, and that's pretty consistent with, with, with good traders. And a good friend of mine is a, was an offshore fisherman in New Zealand for many, many years, uh, 20 odd years and then became a trader uh, when he retired and, and is using his, his, the money he made from fishing to trade with now. And uh, he said, in fishing, the success of any fishing trip is determined before you leave the dock, i.e. it's determined by the preparation and the planning you do before you even get into the boat. And that's the same in trading, folks. If you're a successful home-based trader, who would you approach to get a job with a firm? Uh, are there, there aren't any agencies. Uh, they're not close to non-grads. If you go to a prop group or you go to a trading arcade, they're pretty good actually because they will go for ability and interest and enthusiasm. If you go to an investment bank, it's all about the CV, folks. So unless you've got a strong CV, uh, you're going to struggle. Interestingly, I think we're going to see a shift in how traders are employed and I think we might go to more about competency and ability rather than just academic piece of paper because it was uh, you know, quite a few clever smart people who, uh, who, uh, who were behind 
the global financial crisis, so maybe academic ability isn't always the best predictor of trading ability. And I know a lot of traders who trade in prop groups who would never get jobs in investment banks because of their CV and backgrounds, but are phenomenal traders, absolutely phenomenal traders, and would blow most of those bank traders away. So it is about trading ability. So if you think about IQ, uh, intelligence quotient, you know, we've got PQ, which is practical quotient. We've got EQ, emotional qu quotient. You've got B and Q, which is how good you are at D and y, DIY. And then you've got TQ, trading intelligence. So that's a real key thing as well. Okay, we're going to pop a few slides up now. Um, I'm just going to whisk through them. I'm going to stop the questions for a moment, whisk through the slides, show you what's there. I will stay on at the end and do a bit of Q&A beyond that as well, but I'll highlight some key points we've made with the slides. I think they're going to be shared for us in a moment, so keep your eyes peeled, folks. Let's have a big old cheer when those slides come up. If you want to go to a big corporation to make money, you're going to have to get a good CV, folks. You know, that, that's, that's how it is, you know, and it's getting trickier now, so uh, e even more so. Um, there's, there's no quick and easy way of, of getting into these places, so uh, it's all about that. Let me just see if I can move my slides about on here. Uh, names again of those books I recommended, so I'll just go through them again. We've got uh, Mark Douglas, Trading in the Zone, Brett Steenbarger, Enhancing Trader Performance, High Performance Trading by My Good Self, and then the Market Withers books, and that'll give you a good rounded trading education. Guys, I've managed to scroll to the end of these questions. I've I'm just trying to wait now to get some slides up. So we, I, I mean, I can't see. I keep seeing them flash up my end. Uh, I'm not sure what it's like at your end. I'm just going to type in those books because Alex is having a few problems uh, with, uh, with, it, with, it, with hearing them. So I'm going to type in those book titles now, so bear with me and, uh, and I'll type them all in. Hello.
All right, guys, I'm back now. Can you hear me okay? You probably had enough by now anyway, I guess. It's like the good old days when radio used to be the uh, the main form of entertainment before we had the uh, luxury of TV. So it's uh, taking you back there a little bit. So obviously missed my opportunity to be a hospital radio DJ, as you can probably tell. So we're going to have a bit of a go getting these slides up, and then we'll have a quick whiz through, a bit of Q and A. Uh, well done for showing the persistence to stay with this uh, session tonight. Persistence is a key quality of uh, of any trader. So it's uh, good to see. Trading is more profitable than radio. Um, only if you're good at it. That's <laughs> that's the uh, that's the key thing. So it's. Um, Guys, no, you, you've been you've been a good bunch tonight. We've had some cracking questions coming in, and um, you know it's good to see. You know, it, it trading is not an easy game. The challenge of trading is is coping with the uncertainty. The uncertainty is what makes it interesting, but also makes it challenging. So it's kind of one of those kind of it's like a bit of like a love hate thing. Um, we kind of get into it because of what it is, and then because of because of what it is, is also what we find it frustrating. So um, you've got to kind of stick with it. So. Uh, do I think intuition has a role to play in trading? Absolutely. Um, there's a great book called Blink by a guy called Malcolm Gladwell. It's not a trading book, it's a general book, but it's all about intuition and kind of how we get gut feel. Intuition becomes more important in trading as you become more experienced because what happens is when you're watching your screen all the time, we're learning what we call implicitly. So learning can be explicit. You actually consciously try and learn it, like when you're trying to memorize for your exams and so on. Or it can be implicit where you're learning it by just kind of being involved in it. And it's like unconscious type learning. And within that, your subconscious mind picks up all these patterns and all these um, things that occur, stores them all in a massive library. And when patterns occur or when things in the market happen, sometimes you'll get a feel, you'll get this intuitive feel. And um, it... What, what, it, what it is, it's really the unconscious mind communicating. Now, it's only reliable, really, if you've got lots of experience. If you're not that experienced, then it's more into wishing rather than intuition. And uh, that's important to be aware of. And, and some traders who trade price action, their whole trading strategy is really intuitive. It's all feel. They can't really half the time explain why they're doing what they're doing. So it's all about feel. Uh, so, it's, so it is very, very intuitive. Uh, in Blink by Gladwell, he talks about a firefighter who was at a fire, uh, a, a sub-officer. And uh, I think it was a big um, uh, a factory fire. And he wanted to send in some breathing apparatus guys. And so the station officer wants to send these guys in. And the, the sub-officer says, oh, I, don't, I don't like it. You know, it doesn't, doesn't feel right. And they kind of argue about it for a while. And then the station officer goes, no, no, there's no visible signs as to why we shouldn't send the guys in. And so they send them in. But the sub-officer still feels really uncomfortable. He's got this real bad feeling in his gut. So eventually he persuades the station officer to bring the guys out. And literally moments after they get the guys out, the roof collapses. And when they talk to the guy, he can't, for the life of him, he cannot explain why he thought the guy shouldn't go in in the first place. Um, but he had this feel. And what, they, what they're saying is, having been to many, many, many hundreds of fires, in his unconscious mind, he's got all these patterns and, and, and signs that are there that are, that are beneath conscious perception. And the only way the unconscious can communicate that to him is via gut feel. So it's, um, yeah, definitely intuition does have a, have a part to play. Uh, what is the 10,000 hours rule? The 10,000 hours rule is basically, Gladwell wrote a book, uh, Outliers, and in it basically he uses some research from uh, a guy called K. Anders Ericsson, uh, who spent about 20 years researching expertise, who suggests it takes 10 hours, uh, sorry, 10 hours, 10 years or 10,000 hours to achieve expertise. Um, which is, 
interesting to think about in trading to become an expert trader 10,000 hours in front of the screen. So if you're doing an hour a day, you've got 10,000 days to, uh, to crack on with which is going to take you quite a while, so that's uh, 10,000 days. So what we've got, 250 trading days a year. So about 40 years and uh, you'll crack it. Okay, the slides are just uploading, folks, so if you want to hang on for another three minutes, we're going to have them up to show you. Um, Craig, intuitively, you've typed that question in as I've just answered it, so it, um, that was a good explanation there of intuition, because I knew that's what you were going to ask, you see, so I've already answered it for you. So, slides, yeah, in about three minutes, we'll have the slides, I'm going to whiz through them at, at pretty quick speed just to kind of illustrate visually some of the things we've talked about. Uh, we've actually probably covered a bulk of what I was going to do anyway uh, via our questions, but there's a few things on there to think about and a few new things which I'll, I'll briefly cover. Uh, as I said, if you do email me, I'm happy to send you the slides um, in PDF so you've got them to have a look at for yourselves as well. Uh, happy to spread the love of uh, trading psychology for those who are keen to accept it. Adrian, no problems. If you send me a um, your email, I'll forward the PDF on to you. Thanks for your patience, much appreciated, and, and to all of you, really. Here we go, folks. Sit back, hang on. So that was me, as I explained to you earlier. That's what we were going to cover. Here's what you could have had. Um, so I'm going to whiz through these very quickly now. Here's the performance cycle, what I call the three stages of high performance trading. So we've got planning, which we talked about, which is creating the conditions and opportunity for success. I love that phrase. I love it. That's what you are doing. If you plan and prepare, it is like putting the net out ready for the fish. But it's making sure the net is the right net in the right place. Uh, into implementation and into execution evaluation and then back through. So that was the cycle we've got there. Obviously you can have copies of these as suggested. Planning and preparation. What are the three key factors? A mastery approach. Having a plan and a strategy. Pre-trading preparation. So the mastery approach. This is about being the best you can be. Remember the growth mindset. Taking personal responsibility and focusing on process decision making over results. If you can get those three things sorted out in your own trading then your potential to achieve will be significantly greater than most people because most people will still be looking for the magical holy grail system whilst they're doing that you can go away and master your trading and smash them out of the markets so it's uh, very very important it is about it's not the time and effort you put into trading it's where you put that time and effort into planning and preparation two things you need a business plan if you're trading seriously it's a one-man business you need that business plan. What's it all about? What are your goals? What are the objectives? What resources are you going to use? What training are you going to get? So on, so on, so on, so on, so on. And then trading strategy. What is the strategy? What markets do you trade? How do you trade them? When do you trade them? How do you manage your risk? Uh, how do you manage drawdown? How do you manage it when it's going really well? Um, what percentage of, of, of risk are you taking of your trading capital? and how much of your personal wealth is your trading capital. All things to consider. Plan and prepare. Pilots before they fly, pre-flight check. Traders before they trade, pre-trading prep. Plan and prepare. What potential scenarios? So that's the, research, the uh, rehearsal and eventualities and positive state as we talked about earlier. So three things you can do there. Very practical strategies. If you do those things, significantly going to create the opportunities and conditions for success. So we look at flawless execution. This is where we get to see our Jekyll and Hyde characters coming out. 
Normally sane, rational people become monsters of the market under the pressures of trading. How can we avoid it? Focus on the process, think in terms of probabilities, manage your risk. So focus on the process and what's controllable essentially means get your preparation done, do your evaluation, and while you're executing, just focus on the task and doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. All about your decision making process. Execute. Think probabilistically. So, we have to remember this. Every trade has a non-guaranteed probabilistic outcome. Now, that's a really key belief to hang on to. So when you enter a trade, the outcome is non-guaranteed and it's a probabilistic outcome. We don't know whether it's going to win or lose. We have to have no attachment to the outcome. Easier said than done, I know, but that's where the best traders are at. We don't know the order, the type, or the number of opportunities, or the distribution of outcomes from trading them. So we have to accept the fact that we could get strings of winners, or losers, and so on. And we have to accept the fact that we are going to lose on some trades, and we will have strings of losses. That's just the way trading is. Once we accept all these things, and we have them in our mind, it frees us up and detaches us a little bit away from our P&L. It's probability. It's like the casino. And finally, managing risk is really important. The best traders are focused on managing risk, not on picking winners. There's an overemphasis, I think, in people when they start trading on trying to pick winners. How many winners can I get? Not enough emphasis on actually managing risk, which is critical, because that keeps you in the game, it keeps you learning, and it keeps you around for when the opportunities are there to make money. And importantly with risk, keeping small risk, taking small risk, um, reduces anxiety and prevents the trauma you get from big losses. Very important, very important. So uh, no need to keep it in big sixes, singles and twos are plenty. Just keep banging them away. Every now and again you can hit a six, that's fine, but not every ball. We haven't got to hit every ball for six. Keep playing it, keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. Very important. So again, three things to think about. Focus on the process and controllables. Think in probabilities. Manage your risk. Then we come to evaluation. So look, learn and leverage, which we talked about earlier. Keep a trading log and periodically review that performance. So weekly, monthly, whatever's right for you. But it is important to do that. Continually ask yourself, what have I learned? That is a massively powerful question. And after each trade, what have I learned? At the end of a trading day, what have I learned? At the end of a week of trading, what have I learned? Keep asking yourself that question. That is what took our guy from a £2 million bank trader to a £20 million uh, Paul Tudor, um, Jones hedge fund trader. Yeah. What have I learned? What have I learned? What have I learned? What am I learning? How can I use that to be better? Bang, 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 all the time. And finally, taking action from that learning, yeah, implementing it, feeding it forward, as we say. Yeah, take the feedback and feed it forward. Nice little bit of corporate uh, lingo there, just to keep you all happy. So we get three strategies from evaluation, logging our trades, making learning from your trading a key focus, and uh, acting on the feedback. So all in all, from the slides and from to be honest, most of the things we talked about tonight, based on your excellent questions, uh, we end up with nine things that you can do, three in each area, that actually, if you did all nine of these, would have a phenomenal impact on your trading performance. Um, have a little check now and think about, out of those nine, how many do you already do? Have you got a growth mindset, do you think? If yes, give yourself a tick. Do you always, you know, have you got a, a business plan? Have you got a trading strategy? If yes, tick. Have a little run through. Think how many of those have you got uh, out of the nine. A uh, question there from Raphael. Did I start as a, my career as a trader? No, I didn't actually. I started off in, uh, as a teacher. I was a, a PE and sports teacher for many years. Uh, went into sports psychology, worked in sports psychology for a long time. And then in 2004-05, was asked to come and work for a big trading group in London. Uh, Refco trading as they were, 150 traders, prop traders, 
and uh, they asked me to do some training with their guys on psychology and, and, and using sports psychology with traders and uh, it went really well and, and word of mouth spread and so from 2005 I've been pretty much spending most of my time with traders, not as much in sport anymore and um, whilst I was working with traders, like when I was in sport I, I always used to try and do play the sport I was coaching athletes in to get a feel for it. I thought I'd have a little go at trading, get a feel for it. That was about 2005, 2006 and uh, I've, I've traded ever since as much as I can. I don't get a lot of time. Uh, I like trading but my passion is coaching and, and training and development so that's where my time and energy goes into. Just some things to think about for you. Based on all the things we've talked about today, and we've done a lot of talking, or I, certainly I have, you've done a lot of listening, well done for that. Um, there's some things to think about. There's three stages of high performance trading. Always have in your mind, am I creating the conditions and opportunities for success? Because a lot of things I notice in traders is they don't do the grunt work up front, and that makes it harder when they go to execute then they get loads of psychological or so-called psychological challenges, but they're not, the psychology challenges they're having are because they're not doing all the groundwork up front. So, you know, learning, training, development, practicing their skills, managing their risk, um, growth mindset, evaluating, logging. If you do all the big chunk, the basics, put all the foundations in place, then you can build a nice tall tower. A lot of people don't want to put the foundations down because like when you build a building, the foundations bit, it's all underground, you can't see it, it's not exactly the most attractive part of the building, but actually, it's the most critical. And trading's the same. When you put all the foundations down, they're not always the most exciting things to be doing, they're not always the things that are kind of the most glamorous, but they enable you to build up on top of that, and that, that's really, really key. Uh, and then we go to, so that's a bit about High Performance Global, which I mentioned about, so I've got a blog, uh, which I try and update every week or two, uh, there's some articles on there which you might like to go and have a read of, so the blog, uh, if you go to the homepage of the website, www.highperformanceglobal.com, you can access that from there. Uh, I do a newsletter, not as regularly anymore, because I do much more on the blog, uh, but if you want to sign up to that, you can, you can send me an email. Uh, at the info at High Performance Global, and I'll put you on the list. Um, we've talked about the book, obviously. I've tried to plug it enough times, so if you haven't got the message now, you're never going to get it. One-to-one um, -one coaching, training, a lot of what I do uh, as well. And uh, next year, I'm going to be launching a webinar program, and uh, my, my format is going to be one webinar a month, taking a key theme throughout the year, so there's going to be probably 10 webinars. I won't do probably August or December because of the holiday season and Christmas but I'll probably do 10 webinars next year and uh, one a month they'll, they'll take some of the key themes and much like tonight there'll be um, 45 minutes to an hour of kind of the presentation and then live Q&A after that so be a great point to come and discuss psychology, learn some techniques and strategies um, and, uh, and to, to mix and communicate with other traders as well so if you're keen, if you want to be kept in the loop about the webinars then again if you send me an email I'll add you to the mailing list, and when they come out, I'll make sure that you're, you're, um, you're in the loop on those ones. Uh, so, questions. We've, we've had a few already. I'll take a few more. Um, for those of you who, uh, who want to hang on to the, uh, to the grim death. And uh, one here from Raphael. What's the minimum capital that you think is right to start as a trader? Uh, the minimum capital depends on what you're trying to achieve in your trading. If you're trying to make a living from it, then you need to make sure that by taking your small risk and with the expected return from your trading strategy, it gives you enough to live on. The challenge I find is a lot of people uh, have big expectations for the amount of money they want to make and as a percentage of their capital, the figure is, is, is pretty big. So uh, the more capital you've got, the better because it means you can take smaller risk. To begin with, you know, if you're doing, you know, if you're doing your, your 10p a point or 50p a point or those kind of things or even a pound a point, to give it a try, you don't need to put lots of money in, I don't believe. I think when I first started off, uh, this is 2006 when I started spread betting, I think I put about a thousand pounds into my first account. I was looking for about, I was doing a pound a point, I was trading stock indices at the time in FX, looking for about 30 pips up or 30 pips down. So 
if I lost, I lost 30 quid. If I won, I won 30 quid, give or take a bit. So, um, and that was a good place to learn, you know, with, without putting too much in and taking too much risk. So, the the first part about trading, and this is a key thing. The first few years, certainly the first 12 months, just all about learning. Don't really get sucked into even anything about earning. Earning comes at the back end of the curve. It's all about learning up front and then earning beyond that when you kind of all that all that hard work you've done gets invested in the back end. The big mistake is people get so focused on trying to earn money to begin with, they learn loads of bad habits, get themselves in all kind of financial um, difficulties, and then it's game over. Learn first and then earn. If you go to be a plumber, you learn, you do the apprenticeship first, then you go out and you're a plumber and you start doing the earning. Uh, if you want to be a doctor, you go and do the learning and then you get the earning, you know, and, and, and trading is very similar, you know, it, it is a profession, you know, when it's done well, do the learning, then do the earning. Uh, just got to scroll back for some of these questions. You guys are good on your questions, you're, you're too fast for me. Uh, what would your advice be to someone who's traded for four years and never made any money out of it? I would say, you have to look at your approach, Altab, and see if your approach was flawed or whether you were flawed, if that makes sense. I.e., uh, you could trade, someone could trade for 10 years and make no money, and it could be a reflection of either the fact they just can't be a trader, it's not for them, but it could also be their approach was flawed. So, you know, if, you had good quality, if you've had good quality training, and you've taken your learning very seriously, and you've managed your risk very effectively, and done all the right things, and still not cracked it after four years, then that's one type of feedback. But if it's been a bit of a higgledy-piggledy, uh, type approach, not very structured, uh, not very well risk managed, then that's a different type of feedback to the same question. So only you'll know, to be honest, but um, I know professional traders at prop groups who have gone two years making no money and then gone on to be phenomenal traders. So sometimes you've got to get to the clicking point, but it all depends about how much time and unfortunately how much money you want to put into it. So um, but you're going to have to have a look at your own story and, and see what the conclusion might be. Uh, what's my opinion in risk per trade and psychology? For example, scalping versus longer term. So, scalping versus longer term, um, obviously two very different ends of the continuum in terms of trading style. So, scalping in and out, in and out, you know, nicking a tick or two here and there. Longer term, maybe swing trading two or three days or even maybe weeks, maybe even months. So, the approaches are very different. They also suit certain different types of people. So when I'm working with traders and we do things around recruitment and selection and development, we, you know, we'll have a look at the trader and what kind of person they are and the kind of things they like to do, let them try some different markets out, try different styles of trading, and they kind of get a bit of a fit because it's a bit like, you know, if you think about running, you've got running, then you've got, okay, am I cross country, am I marathon runner, uh, am I a track runner? If I'm on the track, am I 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, 800 meters, mile, 400 hurdles, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, so there's all these variables and it's a bit about finding what works for you. So it's just about, rec if you like lots of planning and analysis, long time, frame, long time frame trading might well suit you. If you like to kind of be in and out and active, then longer time frame stuff might just frustrate you. So it's a bit about knowing yourself and, and also the objectives. If you haven't got lots of time to spend at the screen, then scalping is not going to work out for you because it's all about price action and pattern recognition. If you've only got limited time, then a longer time frame enables you to do more planning, spend a bit of time looking, find opportunities, put them on and leave them. So you've got to look at what you want out of your trading, you know, what you're like as a person, and what's going to work in reality, and kind of get the best mesh uh, to do that. How do you recommend we do our planning? Uh, it's gonna it's gonna change, Italo. It's gonna change to depending on um, what you're trading and how you trade. Um, I can't give you the specifics. That's not my expertise. But the components are to look at things like obviously you know what factors affect you finding a trade and what factors affect whether a trade is a winner or a loser. And then you've got to try and plan and prepare around that to enable you to find opportunities and then to manage your risk as you do it. Guys, I know a few of you have got to shoot now. Thanks ever so much for joining us tonight. And um, 
Thanks for, um, for bearing with us. You've been a great audience. I've really enjoyed it. I'm going to keep going for a few more minutes. And then uh, I'll probably knock it on the head as well. So, But thanks again for everything. And uh, so if you want to have the slides, ping me an email. And uh, if you want to get in touch with more questions, again, fire me an email, guys. Yep. How much money can be made in one year working for a prop trading firm? Uh, there is no set number, uh, Raphael. It all depends on you. It depends on the prop firm. It depends on uh, what you're trading, how you're trading it, the risk limits. A little bit of luck sometimes and good fortune, a following wind. Uh, some guys in prop firms are happy making 40, 50, 60 grand a year. You know, what I would call a, a city salary. They've got the flexibility of being their own boss to a degree. Uh, the best guys, you know, some of them are making two, three, four, five million. So you've got the whole spread depending on ability, uh, the markets you trade and your attitude and, and what you want out of it. Uh, how do we distinguish emotion from objective judgment? Um, one of the key things is to ask yourself, and, and it's a difficult one in the moment, but, but to think about the reasons behind your decision and, and to kind of just pause and listen to yourself and, and get a sense of, is this purely being driven by emotion or is there a strategy? Now, the way I like to help traders do this is have your strategic decisions planned in advance such that in the moment, if you decide to change something, you can look back and refer to your kind of, you know, your in-trade sheet or whatever it might be and say, okay, well, is that something on my checklist? If not, then probably 99 times out of 100, it's emotionally driven. The other 1% of the time, it might be something you haven't thought about. But if you've got kind of your criteria written down in advance, then you can always check back to it and reference against it because that's when you're objective when you wrote it down. How many pips a week is a reasonable haul for a full-time trader from home? It all depends, David, on obviously how much you're trading and your strategy. So if you're trading every day and you, you know, you're doing in and out trades, you know, scalping or, or quite short time frame, you might be nicking a few pips each day. Another guy might make one or two trades a week and just nick you know, a whole bunch of trades, a whole bunch of pips in that time frame. It depends on how much time you've got. It depends on the market conditions. There are so many variables, but you know, I know a friend of mine, he looks for 10 pips a day, you know, 50 pips a week, and then it's then your your income is just uh, a um, is down to a whether you actually get those 10 pips a day, um, but also it's just a function of sizing beyond that, and obviously that depends on your capital. So um, I don't think you have to go crazy if you're sensible, um, but the, but there is no there is no answer. And if people tell you you know this system makes X amount of pips per week and that kind of stuff, I just say it's a load of BS because um, with different marking, market conditions, how can you predict how many pips you're going to make? One week the market's going to be crazy and they might be bang on for your system and you make 500 pips. Next week they could be dead and you make 20. So, you know, it's hard over a week. It's easier to predict maybe over a month. It's easier to predict maybe over a year where the time frame becomes longer and we can take out the variance of the events in between. Is spread better in a good market to start off in uh, or directly invest in share and get ownership? Um, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, I've got no beef or no view on either, to be honest. Spread betting is very accessible uh, and obviously tax-free. So there's some benefits. Obviously, you don't actually own the share. Uh, I think it's horses for courses. Yeah, it depends on what you like to do. So... Um, and probably our, my feel is probably more accessible because of cost as well. How do we bridge the gap between knowing what to do intellectually and actually acting on it physically? Mike, that is the question of the night because that is the challenge of trading. Most people know conceptually, intellectually what to do, but can't do it actually in reality. And what I do a lot in my work and in my training and coaching is about helping people to realise why that is because... A lot of our human conditioning, as I said earlier, is actually anti to the behaviours we need to be successful in trading. And so we have to kind of align ourselves to give ourselves the best chance of being successful. And there are techniques you can do and there are things you can do to raise your awareness. 
But for most people, this is a challenge in trading. It, it's, the challenge is not the market, the challenge is yourself. It's, it's doing the things you know you should do consistently, i.e. it's that flawless execution. And that is all about psychology and how you manage your mind, your beliefs about the market, your beliefs about yourself, uh, and, and understanding how your biology and how the biases that are there in our brain affect our decision making and knowing how to recognize them and overcome them. So um, if you're interested, there's, uh, there's a good book called um, Why Smart People Make Big Money Mistakes. And it talks a bit about decision making errors that people make and it talks a lot about this, this, this balance between intellectual and as you said, they're physically doing it. So how to make, how, sorry, why smart people make big money mistakes. Uh, sounds to me like trading can be as much about athletics, good physical condition as academics. Physical shape is important in trading. It's not the most important factor. Uh, I know a lot of traders are very successful, not in great shape. Uh, but I know a lot of traders who are successful, who are, in, you know, who look after themselves. Certainly being well rested, having good sleep is important, being fresh, being alert, uh, drinking water, feed the brain, you know, hydrate it. Those things are important. So physicality is important to a degree. Not the most important factor, but it, but it is a factor for definite. Someone's doing a bit of uh, football betting uh, and, and losing. Um, with self-discipline, one of the key things is, is if you're trading a time frame and a strategy that aligns with you as a person and your lifestyle, it's much easier to be disciplined than if you're trying to do something that doesn't suit you. you know, it's like trying to do a job that, you, that just doesn't really suit you. It's very hard to stick at that job. But if you're doing a job that you love because it kind of meets your strengths and your interests and you kind of, you know, the rewards are good for what you're doing, then that job's going to be a job for life. So trading's the same, you know, it's about just kind of finding that blend, getting that sweet spot. So um, I think a lot of traders fail in trading purely because they never found the market where they could be successful. How would we go about raising our trading awareness? Number one factor is make a conscious decision to raise your awareness. Number two, evaluation mic in your trading logs and in your journals which you keep very very important that is like having the mirror your 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 trading journals and your and your records of your trades and they all got to go in there i'm afraid folks it's not one just for the winning trades yeah all trades have to go in there and um that is how you raise your awareness because then you have to consciously write about things as well uh question from ray steve do you consider yourself to be a successful trader um I consider myself to be on the path to becoming a successful trader. Um, I know that I can't commit enough time and energy to it to achieve high level success in kind of pure terms. Um, but as I said earlier, that's not my main motivation. I learned to trade to understand traders who are people I work with. I now enjoy trading because I love the challenge of trading. Um, I like to be working with people. I love coaching. I love trading. That's my passion. So my niche um, is that trading is something else that I do enjoy. Uh, I'm profitable. If profitable means successful, then yes, I am. Who do I consider a successful trader? I consider in pure terms anybody who's on the path to being a trader, who's learning and growing and developing themselves and sticking with it to be successful. Because if they keep doing that over time, they've got a good chance of actually becoming monetarily successful. Um, so it's about your approach and your mindset and your philosophy to trading as much as anything else. You can be making money from the markets but not be successful because your approach is flawed and at some point you're going to get a slap and fall down hard on your backside. So um, disciplined, you know, professional traders, professionally and approach traders, I would say are the ones who are successful and who are meeting their objectives and making progress. Yeah. If emotions are taken over your strategy for some particular transaction, you've got to, you've got to think about why, what emotions are you feeling and why are you feeling them. Emotions are messengers. They're giving you feedback. If you're feeling angry, what is it that's making you angry? If you're frustrated, why is that? If you're anxious, why is that? 
think about why you're getting the feeling and that raises the awareness and then you can act on that to try and reduce it. Worst case scenario, if you just want to try and centre yourself, nice diaphragm breathing just centres you in the moment. In through the nose, out through the mouth, nice and slow, breathing through the diaphragm. So as you breathe in, expanding the diaphragm out. As you breathe out, letting it come back in again. Would you say there's a temptation to oversimplify what you think the market is doing? I think different people do different things, Ray. Some people oversimplify and some people overcomplicate. And there's probably a mid-ground somewhere. Uh, you can spend a lot of time, I mean, research shows very strongly a lot, a lot of these market analysts are no more accurate than flipping a coin. So, you know, I mean, at what point, you know, they spend the whole day doing it. And their, their accuracy rates in predicting market direction are no better than flipping a coin. Or marginally, 51, 52%. So, but that's the best ones, you know. That's the best of the best. So, you know, ultimately, if you go back to turtles, find your strategy, manage your risk, keep it simple, be consistent. That's really probably as much as you can do. Is it good to get an idea of what type of trading style, strengths and weaknesses best align with you? Absolutely, Mike. That's one of the key things. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, sorry, Mike, you were just giving Ray some feedback there. Yep, absolutely. Good advice, Mike. Couldn't have done it better than myself. Well done. I think Ray's having a good old chuckle there, so that, that's good. That's probably as good a point as any to end on. It's 21.36 in the UK. I've, uh, I think I've uh, done my stint for the evening. 27, guys, well done. It's a big bulk of you still hanging on there. Well done. Thank you for joining us tonight. Apologies for the earlier confusion. Uh, we've got the slides in the end. Uh, I've enjoyed your company. I think your questions were fan fantastic. And I think the fact that you've stayed on so long and uh, stuck with it shows your commitment to trading and the recognition of your the importance of trading psychology. You've got the email there. If over the next week or so any questions pop in your head you want answering, fire them in. If you want to have a look at the blog, help yourself. Uh, if you want anything else, just email me. If you want to get a good book for Christmas, you know which one it is, High Performance Trading by myself. Other than that, have a very good evening. Uh, I'm going to hand things back over to Shai now to wrap up. All the best and uh, may the markets and, uh, and all the forces of the universe be, be behind you uh, and, uh, and a merry festive period to all of you as well. Thank you very much.